Well, hello everybody. This is uh, GXL fight here, back on Ostentatious. It's been a, it's been about a week or two. I, I I don't know. It's been a while since I've uploaded anything here. Um. So yeah. Uh, welcome back to the action pages of Homestuck. Uh, today we're gonna be covering Act Five, Act Two. Now, before I get, jump right into that, um, I did want to bring something up. Well, first I have an itch I need to take care of. Ah, fuck. Okay, sorry. Something I wanted to bring up is uh, Team One of Gaming. We just got our 3DS capture card that we ordered a while back. So, yeah, that's awesome. So, today, uh, uh, Team 1UP should have a Smash Brothers video for 3DS up. Uh, the Brain just started a Let's Play on his channel. Um, uh, Kingdom Hearts 3D, Dream Drop, Dream Drop Distance 3DS. I'm going to be starting something soon. I'm not sure what 3DS game I want to do. Or what DS game I want to do, for that matter. Well, DS games, I guess, are kind of already possible, but... I'm thinking about doing Omega Ruby. But that's not 100% what I might do. I might do something else, like... Um... Well, I have a couple 3DS games I could do. I could do... Well, I probably won't do Monster Hunter, but I could probably do, like, uh, Fire Emblem or Kid Icarus or Pokemon X and Y. Something. Either way doesn't really matter. This is not what this channel is about. But I do like to use this channel to get that information out there for you guys. Again, if you are subscribed here, please go check out my actual channel. Um, it does actually have some entertainment to it. I'm almost done with Pokemon Ruby over there, by the way. Can't wait. I actually should be training for my final episode. I did do some training, and... Anyways, um, I'm going to be reading Act 5, Act 2, so I should probably uh, not be making this any longer than it needs to be. Anyways, please go check out my other channel. Please go check out Team 1UP Gaming. Please go check out The Brain, Mortal. Dave's just started a Left 4 Dead 2 series. Anywho's, again, please go check out those guys and check out my other channel. Anyways, let's continue Act 5, Act 2. Or begin. Okay, he is already here. Began on September 19th, 2010, and end, uh, ended on October 25th, 2011. Uh, the recaps of it were on January 2nd, 2011 to September 6th of 2011. It has 1,481 pages, 1,555,299 words in text, and 24,363 words in media. So the synopsis. The synopsis of Act 2, Act, Act 5, Act 2, Cascade and Intermission 2. Together, these parts of Homestuck tell how the kids and trolls spend the final hours of their sessions and how their universes die. So this synopsis is going to uh, cover um, ca the Cascade, which is awesome. Even though we are going to go and watch Cascade anyways. Um... After an invincible demon with a bloody hand interrupts the trolls' victory, the, they retreat to a maze-like laboratory in the Vale, the asteroid belt that surrounds the medium. They hide there for just over ten hours while the demon lays waste to the troll isophosphere, flying to one planet after another and blowing them up in green fire. While the trolls are holed up, they, the demon will destroy all twelve of their personal lands, their prospect, their dirt, and their cre creature that embodies the, their ultimate reward in Skya. Karkat gets his first close look at the demon when it flies to Prospect and kills the Prospect dream selves. Later, when Karkat learns about the kids, he begins to piece together where the demon came from. After witnessing Prospect's destruction via Smelloscope, Trezzy gets an unexpected money transfer, which Sol trans traces to a donor inside the universe the trolls created. That donor is Dave, and that is how the trolls discover the kids. Trezzy's position outside of the kids' universe lets her use a chat client to observe their walking lives and troll them at any point in the alpha timeline with no regard for the arrow at, of time. At Karkat's prodding, other trolls join in and make contact at many different times in the kids' lives, although they are particularly drawn to the final day of the kids' timeline. 24 hours after the reckoning starts, their view of the kids' session is cut off by a phenomenon called the Scratch. Taking an interest in Dave's advancement, Trezzy trolls him intensively. In one of many self-causing interactions fueling the two groups' chronologically sidewaysness, Trezzy guides Dave to a crocodile stock market and 
persuades him to use his time travel loops to run a scam and get rich so he can send her the money she already received. They also draw comics for each other. It's a cultural exchange. <laughs> Exploring his land, Dave finds the sword Cal Calid Flitch in a stone and gets it out by breaking it in half. The this provokes a wave of monsters and to attack. Dave calls on Dave's friend to protect him from Hephaestus, Hephaestus minions and then abruptly falls asleep. After slaying the monsters, Dave's right flies away to John's planet to help out Bro, who is being chased by the Sovereign Slayer. Pre uh, the Dreaming Dead. Previously, Dream Jade died, and Jade's dream bot exploded, blowing up her bedroom thanks to a sweet catch by Beck. Jade lands outside of her bed and falls asleep again. After Carcat and Jade's dream selves die, their dreams take place among the tentacle gods who live in the furthest ring. The infinite warp space time between game sessions. On waking, Carcat warns the other trolls with dead dream selves they should not sleep, lest they have the same nightmares with the horror terrors. Feffery, un unafraid of the dream self afterlife, de defies Carcat. In Dream Feffery's last moment, she speaks with the gods and asks them to make an environment in the furthest ring where all the dream dead can meet. Then the demon comes to Durst and slays the Durst's dream selves. Ring recap. When the kids' session started, the queens of Prospect and Durst each had a ring of orbs, fourfold, which gave the wearer new features each time a kid entered the medium, reflecting what the kid did with their kernel sprites. John Rose and Dave's entries added to the queen's appearance and powers. Jade's entry was still to come. In Act 4, both queens lost their rings. Durst's Durst's archagent Jack Noir took the Black Queen's ring and would continue to use its power throughout his multi-session rampage. Prospect's ring was more finicky. Finicky. It would change hands many times before being used again. The Parcel Mistress, the Courtyard Droll, and Dream Jade each had it briefly. After Dream Jade died when Mahasat's moon fell to sky, Dream John took the ring from her body, but that was the only was only the beginning of its journey. John wakes. Previously, John fell asleep in, the, in a lab in the veil because his dream self woke. When the reckoning propelled the lab towards sky, the authority regulator strapped the sleeping boy to his rocket board and sent him back to the land of wind and shade. The regulator stayed in the lab. It fell through the, a sky and defense portal and ex exiled him on Earth. John lands on his planet without waking up. Taking an interest in John's advancement, Riska trolls him intensively. Wandering the battlefield with Liv Tyler, the robot bunny... Dream John spots his dad and Rose's mom. He rushes to meet them when he is awoken and disappears in mid-leap, dropping the White Queen's ring into a river. The wary villain finds, a downstream, finds it downstream while mourning his com comrade slain by Jack Noir. The villain holds onto the ring but does not put it on. Waking up on Loas, John receives his Spur of Server copy by Parcel of Pixies and rushes home to get Jade into the game. The Rose of Server duties have made John's house enormously tall. Going up, John finds Nas right far above his oily planet. She feeds John and makes him uncomfortable and on a floating bed, on a floating ghost bed, while he gets ready to be Jade's server player, unaware that the ocean of oil below him is now on fire. Jade plays. Feeling miserable after enduring dream night dream death, nightmare, and crab man anger, Jade starts playing Spur with John. A meteor of cataclysmic size, the one that will wipe out human life on Earth, has Jade's island in its sights. With ten minutes on the clock, Jade and John ponder on what to put in Jade Colonel Sprite. Their choices choice will shape the minions ring the minions, ring wearers, and battlefield of their session. Rose warns them to prototype something at all costs, or they won't be able to dig up a treasure that is found in the core of their session's fully prototyped battlefield. Baffled by her entry item, Jade pastures Dave to find for help, but a stupid crocodile answers instead. John fumbles around with Jay, or with Grandpa's trophies and then succumbs to a rogue nap before he can prototype anything. In his dream, he returns to the sky and sees the villain holding the ring he lost. Before they can meet, the battlefield starts changing all around them. John wakes up, lost and vulnerable. The ghost bed has landed on the surface of the land of wind and shade, standing, straining him on a jut of rock in the middle of the oily sea while red fire creeps over the horizon. Carcade is at the peak of his anger when his when he chooses this moment for his second try at trolling John. Carcat has just discovered that the event that led to his own hopeless situation. When John asks him for news of Jade's entry, he explains with disgust that they are one and the same. Huh. 
Huh. Okay. With both boys asleep and unable to help Jade enter, Becquerel, the god, god dog, takes charge. Beck jumps into Jade's kernel and becomes Beck Sprite. Beck Sprite immediately flies up and attacks the oncoming meteor to buy time for Jade. An apocalyptic green shockwave circles the earth, killing humanity. Jade creates her entry item, a Beck-shaped piñata and a blindfold. Flailing the butt of her rifle around, she swings and hits the piano and is blasted out of the atrium window. It's a long fall, giving Jade time to turn the gun around and fire it midair. Beck's sprite teleports the bullet and the piano smashing it. Jade and her house enter the medium. Beck's prototyping takes effect, transforming the battlefield for the fourth and last time and adding Beck's features to those who wear the ring. First Guardians are immortal beings ecobiologized by agents and sent to Sky to watch over the planets that receive bird players. The source of their limitless power is an object called the Green Sun. Alternia's first guardian is, a, is the, cunning, the cunning puppet Doc Scratch. Earth's first guardian is the dog Becquerel. The Sovereign Slayer Jack Noir inherits Becquerel's power. Carcat concludes that this is the biggest disaster and source of woe in both sessions. God Boss. Bro Strider ends his first duel with the Slayer by stabbing his katana into the Beta Mesa and Lohak land a low hack landmass that resembles a vinyl record. Bro flees to low ass. Ja- Jack Noir pulls the sword out of the- out and follows him there for round two. Bro is aided this time by his newly repaired puppet Lil Cal and Dave Sprite. Escaping the puppet's awful clutches for a moment, Jack uses his ring to set fire to the oily rivers and sea of John's land. Bro and Dave Sprite are still teaming up on Jack when he re- his ring receives the fateful fourth prototyping and gives him the face and powers of Beck. He becomes the invisible demon Beck Noir. What seemed like an e- even fight is over in a heartbeat. Noir slays Bro, imbuses the spreading fire with his new first guardian energy, and takes Lil Cal for a trophy. The Windy Thing the fire turns green and spreads across the ocean, circling the rock John is stranded on. After Carcat is done telling John about Jade's entry, Riska explains to John why it happened. She was the one who put John and Dave to sleep with her psychic power. She did it so that she could be responsible for the rise and fall of Beck Noir. She is planning to leave the hideout and find Noir single-handedly. Or fight Noir single-handedly. Goaded to action by Riska and the wayward Vagabond, John taps into his own tent latent powers. A breeze circles his planet, putting out all the fire. The wind lifts John off the rock, deposits him on the shore of a salamander village, and subsides. Talking to the locals, John learns that the game has a personal quest in store for the error of breath. Defeating the denizens Hyphias will make John the savior of the salamanders and fireflies that live on his world. But first, to gain any more power, he needs to find his quest bed <gasps> and sleep on it. Or so says Riska. John climbs up on his quest bed. It is a slab of rock bearing the symbol of breath. Riska offers to put John to sleep on the slab. John decides to trust her and accepts her help. Beck Noir murders the sleeping child. The God Tears. We saw before that a timely smooch can revive a dead player or dying player who, whose dream self is alive. Dreamer is alive. The waking self stays dead while the dream self recovers and gets on with life. During Scurb, the after Radia fatally wounded Riska, Tavros intended to. Resuscitate Resus- Riska this way, but she refused the kiss. Riska knew of a better resurrection mechanism, that one that would allow a deserving hero like herself to rise up to the god tears. She made Tavros fly her to her quest cocoon. She also asked him to hasten her death, but he could not do that. Regardless, when Riska's waking body finally bled out and lay dead on her sacrificial slab, her dream self rose up to Skaya as the god tier thief of light. The perks of godhood include a conditional sort of immortality, freedom from exile oversight, a colorful new outfit that reflects the hero's title, patrols, gossamer fairy wings. Riska is the only troll to have earned her wings before beating the game. In the same fashion, a firefly, as fireflies gather to hug John's corpse on his quest bed, his dream self rises up on Skaya as the god tier heir of breath. Dave has been tra- traveling in stable time loops, so much that there are several instances of him running around at any given moment during the Reckoning. This gives him time to learn more about his session while gaming the, lo- ga- gaming the low-hack stock exchange and handling server duties for Rose and Jade. 
He also learns that he and John are the objects of a rivalry between Terezi and Vriska. Terezi offers to help Dave rise up to godhood, but unlike Vriska, she, she makes Dave fully aware of the sacrifice it requires. She leads him to make a binary choice that results in a doomed Dave sleeping on his quest bed, a slab bearing a, the symbol of time, and the presence Alpha, and then presents Alpha Dave with the, the option of slaying doomed Dave so that he can rise up. Terezi already knows from looking ahead that he will refuse to kill himself. There's nothing she can do to change doomed Dave's fate. The Alpha Dave walks away. The doomed Dave wakes up and gets off the slab. Beck Noir appears and murders the doomed Dave mere steps from his quest bed. He does not rise up. Beck Sprite. Rex Bright catches Jade with her bed, and again, she falls asleep again. This time, instead of direct exposure to the gods of the furthest ring, Jade's dream is contained in one of the memory bubbles Fefri asked to make, asked them to make. Jade rely, rely, relives an old conversation with the Alternian Fish Princess. When it diverges from how it originally went, she discovers that she and Fefri are actually meeting in the bubbles in the bubble, and that Fefri is dead. Jade wakes up on her new planet Lofaf, the land of frost and frogs. She fights an imp that teleports her all over the place, just like Beck used to do. One of the, her gunshots wakes Dave from a dream in which he looked out the horror terrors and visited the darkening dream rose in her tower on Durst's moon. Jade's hope for a talking sprite are dashed when he, she meets Beck's sprite. He only speaks in a blinding green noise. Return, returning to her house, Jade learns from Dave that John is get busy getting his wind on and can't be her server player anymore. Dave fills John's shoes, replacing the alchemy equipment that was destroyed when Jade entered. Jade is preparing to alchemize items when Tavros asks her if he can commune with Bexprite for the second time. Tavros has just saved a younger Jade from accidentally shooting herself. He used Bex to teleport the bullet towards an old man he mistook for a trespasser on Jade's island. Tavros's thing, Tavros thinks that sending Beckbright to fight Becknor will solve everyone's problem. He is high on this self-confidence that can only come from a shiny new pair of legs. Kanaya and Equius replaced his immobile lower half with a robotic prosthesis, prosthesis while he was sleeping. It doesn't take it doesn't take stairs very well, although that doesn't stop Tavros from trying. Jade refuses. She's upset to learn how her grandpa was killed, but a bit of alchemy lifts her spirits. She makes all sorts of stuff, including a legendary ruffle from Aridin and a pair of Google goggles based on Rose's crystal ball. She uses the goggles to see her friends around the medium. Seeing a couple of Jack's random teleportation murder victims upsets her again and changes her mind about using Beck's right to stop him. Tavers is no longer available, so Jade just does the next best thing. She goes up into the, goes up into the ball at the top of her house where Grandpa stored her stuff and mounted Dream Self in Jack's fourth wall. She summons Bexprite and completes his prototyping by throwing her dream dreamer's corpse into him. Bexprite becomes Jade Sprite. Jade Sprite is useless. She's confused and upset at being wretched wretch, from the afterlife. Her outburst breaks the ball of the house and sends it careening down the hill. It rolls to a stop next to a stump of dismay. The fourth wall flicks on in chaos, allowing us to intrude on Hussey in his study. He introduces his servant, Miss Paint, a prospect in exile, and types up the third and final recap in Homestuck. Carcat advises Jade to turn off and take the fourth wall. Jade's sprite flies away to Skya. <sighs> Genesis Frog with Kanaya's help, Jade starts to learn about her land and her personal quest as the Witch of Space. Kanaya contacts a later Jade, hoping to learn something about Rose, but th by then Jade has begun to enforce a linear chronolo chronologically with Karkat and Kanaya. She won't talk to them out of sequence. Kanaya is forced to talk to an earlier Jade first. Kanaya finds the earlier Jade setting up equipment that became available when she entered Lofat. As a more experienced hero of space, Kanaya explains what the cloning apparatus is for. It's a miniature version of the ectobiology lab where John cloned the babies. It is used for breeding frogs, which with the end goal of creating the Genesis Frog, which Prospect idolizes. Also known as the Speaker of the Vast Croak, the Genesis Frog is that is the creature that embodies the ultimate reward. It is an entire universe. Breeding a frog of this nature and situating it in sky after the reckoning is how the trolls created the kid universe the universe the kids grew up in. Alas, Jade won't have time to make a Genesis frog. It normally takes weeks of work, and she has less than a day left before the scratch. But she decides to try anyway. Rose. Okay, I'm gonna take a break. I like not like a big break. I'm just gonna stop reading for a second and drink.
Also, I'm sorry if I'm either mumbly, mumbling, reading too fast, or messing up words. I'm doing what I can. Okay, Rose. As the seer of light, Rose is supposed to play the rain and contend with her denizen. Sadus, who ate all the fish in the land of light and rain, but having learned that her session is barren and can't be completed as intended, Rose rejects her scripted quest. She starts tearing her land apart with dark magic, looking for a way to do something more important, something that the gods of the furthest, furthest ring have suggested to her. Kanaya and Aradia beg Rose not to lead not to be led down such a destructive path. Kanaya has taken a liking to Rose and is struggling to understand and avoid contributing to the mysterious event that makes her view of the of future Rose go dark. Drawing from every available source of information, including an, an all-knowing puppet who lives in another universe, Rose comes up with a plan to neutralize Beck Noir. The trolls have indicated that Noir is a source of failure failure and continuing threat in both sessions. They believe Noir appeared in their Siphosphere after a rift in space called the Scratch, banished him from the kids' ice Siphosphere. This is why Carcat blames the kids for the trolls' misfortune. Rose's plan is to create the Scratch and then stop Noir's rampage through this, the troll session by taking away his power source. She will do the latter by parting b latter part by detonating a bomb at the location of the Green Sun, but not just any bomb. The aforementioned treasure at the center of sky is called the Tumor. It is an artifact of the session's infertility, and it should have enough power to destroy the Green Sun, removing Beck's power and making Jack Noir beatable again. Dream Dave will listen to the gods and draw a map. Dream Rose will use this map to navigate the furthest ring and deliver the bomb. This will be a suicide mission for Dream Rose. Instrumental in both parts of the lab of the plan will be John, who is poised to dig up the Tumor and destined to land... And yeah, and destined to go to the land of heat and clockwork to, later to initiate the scratch, since that is what Carcat sees him doing the very first time he trolls him. In the meantime, Rose's plan in, is the furthest re thing from John's mind. See, I can already tell I'm fucking up. All right, I am so proud of you. I am so so proud of you. After rising up as the heir of breath, John is back on the battlefield where he saw his dad and Rose's. Mom earlier. John loses hours watching Sky and Cloud Visions. The clouds have shown him that his new follower, the Way Wary Villian, is destined to keep carrying the White Queen's ring. John finds Dad's wallet, which yields tons of sentimental and practical items, including shaving cream, a spare car, and a much needed computer. John gets back in touch with his friends and flexes his windy powers by taking the villain for a flying joyride around Sky's new form. His last prototyping has created a tangled wreath of land orbiting the battlefield and healed the craters left by Noir's Red Miles and the crash of Prospect's Moon. Learning from Jade and that his dad and, Ma and Rose's mom are in a castle on the battlefield, John goes looking for them until Risker reminds him that he has some planet surgery to do. He puts his pursuit of dad on hold and operates on the battlefield. He whips up a tornado to drill a hole into the core and flies down to locate the tumor. What he, he finds, surrounded by carvings of his friends, of his human friends' god tier symbols, is a gigan, giant magic taijitsu ball with a timer counting down to the end of the reckoning. He tucks the bomb into Dad's wallet and returns to the surface. Friend Leader when Jack Noir became Beck Noir, he didn't just gain Beck Noir's first guardian powers. He also received the dog's loyalty and love for Jade, unwelcome feelings that have already prevented him from murdering her once. This hiccup is his otherwise remorseless killing spree troubles him. He tries to get around his doggy feelings by assigning Jade's murder to the courtyard drawl, who has been searched, searching the battlefield for the White Queen's ring. The silly droll instantly forgets his old, his new orders when he and Liv the bunny cross paths with John, who has just resurfaced. Liv gives John another note from the pen pal who helped build her. The note describes Liv's green eyes, which can enlarge objects and tells John to grow the bunny's miniature weapons, most of which of these weapons were lost in the breeze. The only one left is the Warhammer of Zillihu, and after Liv huggins it, everyone marvels at its beauty. Long enough for the villain to eat Liv's green eye and preclude any more huginings. 
The tumor still has to be delivered to Durst's moon, but John wants to keep looking for Dad, so he delegates. He gives the villain the wallet and asks his three new friend followers to take it to Dream Rose for him. The commander of Durstite battleship left over from the war and fly away. There is a they commandeer a Durset battleship left over from the war and fly away, John, leaving John with no computer. Right after seeing them off, John notices a cloud of grim darkness descending on the planet and goes, in, goes to investigate. He enters the darkness. The trolls can no longer see him in their chat client viewports. Okay. Grimdark. Rose goes to Lohack and pesters Doc Scratch, the first guardian and master manipulator of Alternia. He feeds her information about the Green Sun, the rules of godhood, and his own mission to summon his master, Lord English. Scratch also corrects one of the falsehoods on which Rose's plan rested. Scratch is, Scratch is not a rift in space, and its purpose is not to exile Jack Noir. The Scratch is built in is a built-in mechanism for resetting and changing things on Earth prior to the start of the game. Its purpose is to replace an unwinnable session that is a session that cannot produce the ultimate reward with a new one that could be winnable. When completed, the scratch will erase the kid's entire medium and anyone left inside. An iguana servant brings Rose an object from Jade's house. It is a magic cue ball that is said to be the opposite of a magic eight ball. Its blank surface hiding perfectly precise and specific answers to any question. This oracle becomes the final topic of Rose's conversation with the white text guy. He describes it as one of his seeds and prods the seer to figure out how to use it. The ball tells her to answer Jade, who has been, who she has been ignoring. Jade has awful news. Jack Noir has murdered Rose's mom and John's dad and on the battlefield. Rose is angered and changes her mind about what to throw her life away doing. She wants to fight Noir right away, since the alternative now seems equally futile. Jade tries to talk her out of it when they debate the agenda of the gods who sent set Rose down this path. Doc Scratch nudges them towards settling the question with one more use of the cue ball. Rose asks whether the gods are evil. The ball gives her an answer that might be either garbled nonsense or a message in the language of the gods. If Rose knows, she does not say, because the answer changes her. She goes grimdark. She disappears from the troll's sight, exudes a thick black aura, and flies straight to Skya, thinking of nothing but vengeance and death. On the battlefield, Rose enters Prospitian Castle, where Mom and Dad were killed. Following Jack Noir's trail of dismembered chess pieces and frog statues, she finds the happily ignorant John, who still hasn't seen their parents or Noir. Rose, Rose tries to tell John what happened, but John does not understand the, the broad fester tongues. She leads him back to the scene of the crime so he can see for himself. Conditional immortality. John, Rose and John find Jack standing over their murdered parents. They draw their weapons, but for John, the fight is over before it starts. Noir stabs him and he falls over dead, driving Rose to a new heights of violent fury. She channels her darkest magic, blowing another huge crater into the face of the battlefield. The seer and the slayer fight to the death. They trade a few blows, but it's not a particularly challenging duel for the godlike archagent. Rose falls and dies next to John. Noir then fields an asinine call from the courtyard droll. The droll stole Dad's wallet from the war worry villain and snuck off the Dursite battleship in an escape pod. But the wallet contains neither the tumor nor the ring he was hoping to find. Liv Tyler lifted the tumor out of the wallet while the droll wasn't looking, after pointing out that none of this is relevant to the droll's orders to assassinate Jade. Noir goes back to the battleship himself and rips it in half. The villain stays on the broken ship as it falls back to the Skya. It enters a Skyan defense portal and exiles him to Earth. Liv takes an escape pod and flies away to Durst's moon. Noir gets the low faff. God tier heroes have conditional immortality. They only stay dead if their death is morally significant. The death is judged neither just as an in, as in comeuppance nor heroic as in self-sacrifice, then the hero will soon come back to life. We don't know who judges fallen heroes. There is a clock in Doc Scratch's parlor that indicates either indicates or influences the result. It's not clear which. John comes back to life, whole and healthy. He finds Rose beside him and gives her a corpse smooch. 
Dream Rose's, Rose recovers on Durst's moon and waits for Liv Tyler, Liv's arrival with, while Carcat directs John to prepare for the next stage of Rose's plan. To initiate to initiate the scratch, he will need to damage the Beta Mesa on Lohak by dragging a giant needle across its surface. By this time, Jade has learned that the kids might be able to avoid being erased by the scratch and meet up with the trolls afterwards. She has persuaded Carcat to help out with the plan. P.S. I'll find my frog. When Jade entered the dormant entered, the dormant volcano beside her house came in to the medium with her. One of Jade's tasks is to stoke the forge, i.e. make the volcano active, which will thaw out Jade's island so she can collect the frog she has paradoxified. Jade wakes her denizen, Echidna, and stoke the forge. And stokes the forge. These events happen off screen and it's unclear when they uh, whether they are related. Dave visits Jade Dave visits Jade on Lofaf to help her find frogs in the thaw. Jack Noir butts in on their expedition and they fight. Noir riddles Dave with Jade's own bullets. Dave dies and Jade is forced to save him with a kiss. Dave saw this happen in an earlier time travel loop, but decided that averting his death wasn't worth spawning another Doom timeline. Jade's corpse move, smooch revives Dream Dave on Dave Durst's moon. After killing Dave, Jack Noir follows Jade around for the rest of the session, still unable to harm her thanks to the loyalty he inherits from Beck. Jade visits Echidna twice, first to ask the mother of monsters for one of her huge quills, which John needs to scratch the Beta Mesa, and then to get help reading the Genesis Frog in time. When heroes meet their denizens, they must make a faithful, faithful choice. In return for helping with the frogs, Echidna binds the witch's face to a promise that sounds impossible. When Jade escapes the scratch, she must bring all the denizens and all their lands with her. For her end of the bargain, Echidna helps Jade recall an old memory. As a child, Jade was sleepwalking around the lagoon and found an unusual frog that died when she picked it up. This frog's paradox slime is the final ingredient that Jade needs to complete the Genesis frog's genome. She paradoxifies it, adds its genes to the sequence, and spawns a tadpole that will become the speaker of the vast croak, if she can find a more fertile sky to nurture it. Seeing Jade finish her tadpole, Karkat reflects on his mistakes. Verb is now his is how universes procreate. A successful session produces a new universe for the players to claim as their ultimate reward. When Karkat and Kanaya spawn the frog that contains the kids' universe, they were in such a rush that the, that its genome was incomplete and it had a malignant defect. Karkat identifies Vec Noir as the embodiment of this defect, an agent empowered to render its hostile host stero, sterile. Escape the host and destroy it from the outside. Thus, Carcat blames himself for Noir's rise. Sprite's on the battlefield. With the forge lit, Dave's denizen, Hephaestus, is able to repair something for the hero who seeks him out. This hero is not exactly Dave. Dave Sprite was badly injured when he and Bro fought Jack Noir and lost. Sometime later, seeing Dave neglect his personal quest at another time, Dave Sprite decides to do as much as he can in Dave's place, starting with Kaladif Lich. The broken bird takes the sword to Hephaestus, who offers to fix one of them. Dave Sprite chooses the sword, and Hephaestus fashions it into a new one, the Royal Deringer. Having done this, Dave Sprite flies the sky to spend the rest of the reckoning with Dave Sprite. The meteors from the veil have overwhelmed Sky's defense portals and begun to strike the battlefield. Jade Sprite sends the Deringer away to Durst. Nana Sprite is also on the battlefield. She uses her son's PDA to talk to his acquaintance, screen name Fedora Freak, who is dying in a different session. She tells him a story about her adoptive mother, the cruel alien Betty Crocker. Rose ganks the rock. Liv Tyler delivers the tumor to Dream Rose and Dream Dave, who argue over the rights to the suicide mission. While they are discussing how to pilot Nurse's moon into the furthest ring, the Deringer arrives embedded in the ground. Once again, Dave snaps the sword from the stone. He uses the broken Deringer to serve, sever the chain of Durst, freeing the moon from its orbit. He is about to fly the moon away when Rose zonks him with a sportsway's yarn bonk. The horror terror is granted for fairies' wish by making the furthest ring into an afterlife for heroes and their dream selves. The moon fly, the moon's flight into the furthest ring crosses the dream bubbles where Dave is dreaming. Rose 
plays along with Dave's reenactment of events until he realizes that he t- she took the mission from him. After talking it out, they are jumped by the menacing draconian dignitary. The dignitary speaks Dave's spears dre- Dave's dream projection, making him wake up on Earth. Knowing that Rose is in danger, he fl- is out in pursuit of Durst's moon, which is by now a speck in the void. By the time Dave catches up with the moon and slays the douchebag, it is too late to get back. Or go back. The ice of his fear, Dave and Rose left, is about to be erased. They continue on deeper into the incomprehensible warp space time of the furthest ring until they reach the appointed place for blowing up the green sun. Because the green sun is not there. Shaving cream? John says the scratch in motion by scratching a kidna's needle across the beta mesa and then lifting the mesa up and away to Skya. At last, way a last wave of minions try to stop him, but he defeats them hand, handily with a popomatic viral who, a hammer by he alchemized from Vriska's florid octet dice weapon. As the scratch nears completion, it makes the sky crackle all over the medium, signaling its imminent erasure. The courtyard droll uses the content of Dad's wallet to assassinate Jade. She is on top of her house, putting the Genesis Frog Tadpole into an oversized Magic 8-Ball tank. Behind her, Jack Noir fast-forwards to the, the view of the lagoon on the monitor used until it shows the exiles who would gather in the same place centuries later. Something drifts out of the scratchy sky and lands between Noir and Jade. It's one ton beard buster bomb. The explosion kills Jade and knocks the Genesis Tadpole off the roof and into the fiery port. The droll is tickled by his handiwork until he sees its effect on Noir, whose doggy love for Jade has not relented. Noir kills the droll in anger, takes the wallet, and flies Jade's body across the faff to her best bed, a slab of rock bearing the symbol of space. He lays her on the sacrificial slab and leaves. He goes to the veil and enters the frog meteor and puts himself in the Lotus Time capsule. The frog meteor speeds towards Gaia and is one of the last meteors to be intercepted by a defense portal and sent to Earth. However, it is perhaps the first to arrive on Earth since Gaia chooses the time and on the other side of the portal. Carrying everything that has entered the Lotus, the frog meteor strikes a Paleozoic Earth. Its frog temple grows in the grows up in the impact crater, which becomes a lagoon on, the, on Jade's Island. And inside this temple is the exit Lotus. Everything that has entered the Lotus in the medium comes out of the one of comes out of the one on Earth. As we saw previously when a copy of Spur made its way from the dignitary to Jade. Sorry, I'm getting a little blech because this has almost been over a half hour. It's almost been an hour probably. The reckoning has risen in violence, meteors striking the battlefield constantly. One meteor is headed straight for Jade Sprite and Dave Sprite. As hummingbirds surround Jade's corpse on her quest, but Jade Sprite rises up as the god tier witch of space. Thanks to her dual inheritance of heroic godhood and back nature, Jade assumes total command of matter and space in the medium. She stops the meteors, miniaturizes, and gathers up all the planets and boards a Prospitan battleship with John. She then gets out the fourth wall, enlarges it until it is bigger than the ship, and propels the ship through the glass and out of their null session. After landing on the arid post-reckoning Earth, the exiles wandered and found command station that showed them the progress of the kids through the medium. The station also brought the exiles together at the site of the frog ruins on what was once Shades Island, through the ocean, though the ocean has evaporated. The wayward vagabond's cork station flew him to the ruins from the site of Rose's house. Paragon Mendicant's apple station came from the site of John's house, and the windswept question's egg came, station came from the site of Dave's apartment. The aimless red again is the odd one out. He landed near the frog ruins and has not found any station corresponding to Jade's house. When he acted the other, when he attacked the other exiles, a sentry worm shot back, lasering off the head of the frog icon. In Act 4, the mendicant was crowned as Prospitan Monarch, and the vagabond revealed that he had been safeguarding the White Queen's ring. The Royal Itinerary. Itinerary. I don't know. The Questant has a key that flips certain switches in the command station after cor- coronating the mendicant. The Questant finds a switch on a half buried fragment of a station behind the Frog Temple. When she flips the switch, fragments fly together from all over the earth and assemble the back head station. This station falls on the temple from above and rests on the pillars of the headless frog icon. 
The Vagon finally realizes that the boy he met on the battlefield is the same one he was commanding recently. Returning to the Cork station to view John's progress, the Vagabond and his firefly find John on the, ro on the rock in the sea. They watch John make the breeze happen, find his quest bed, and die on it. Then the console goes dark, and the Vagabond has no more access to John. When he was on the battlefield, he saw John rise up, he, and he, but he doesn't get how these events are related or in the order in which they happen. He thinks that John has died for good and his work as an exile is over, but he can't leave the Cork station just yet. While issuing some forceful commands, he presses the caps lock key. Barry's fellow barriers fell around the exit and the station ran out of power. Without fuel, the Vagabond cannot, can't get out or operate the syndicator. There was a chunk of uranium, but he ate it earlier in the day, so just like the heroes of Promiswith did when there was no exit, he makes a fort for his imagination and goes to sleep in it. Oh, wow. The Vagabond's dream tempts him to put on the ring and receive the power, reminding him that of the horrors that were per perpetuated using its twin. The dream ends with a weird bug that resembles Riska, telling him not to bother with vengeance. She wishes to fight the Sovereign Slayer herself. Flying out through a small gap to help. To get help. Serenity finds the quest in teaching the new monarch royal duty, duties. The Sendificator in the Cork Station sends things back to the Insiphosphere that they came from, but it can also be set to send things outside the kids' universe. That is the Troll Insiphosphere, since that is where the universe lives. Using the Sendificator, the Monarch will be able to lead the Exiles to a new land, but first they must wait for one more Wanderer to arrive. The White King exiled himself and became a Right Keeper. He, when he comes out of the Lotus Time Capsule, they, are, will, they will all leave the universe together. To ensure no one can follow them, they make the Amos Renegade demolish all the stations. He gets to work raking the stations with explosives that, so that all syndificating equipment will be destroyed. While preparing the, the back head station, the Renegade enters and finds a console monitoring Dave's progress in the medium. He finds Dave mourning his dead bro and talking to Rezzy about justice. The Renegade commands Dave for a short while and then goes back to his bombs. Everything is set to blow up when the Monarch sees a tendril of super deadly red shit appear in the sky above them. Oh my god. The Red Miles. Give me a second. I want to see how much more I got. All right, um, guys, I've probably been reading for close to an hour, so what I'm actually going to do is um, stop here. I'm going to make a part two to this, and I'll see you guys then. All right. Oh, wow, 45 minutes. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to stop now, and I'm going to continue reading in the second episode of this. So I'll see you guys in Act 5, Act 2, Part 2.